Welcome to Norman Williams Public Library. We're very happy today to have the second part of Frank Gatto's lectures on Stephen Crane and the birth of American realism. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about Frank before we begin. Frank received a doctorate in American literature from Duke University. He taught at Union College for 33 years, and during that period, he was twice a Fulbright lecturer at the University of Uppsala in Sweden. One result of those awards after 17 years was The Passion of Ingmar Bergman, a groundbreaking study of the doleful imagination of a master filmmaker. Among Gatto's many other publications, his favorites are the introductions to Charles Brockton Brown's Arthur Mervyn and two collections of the short stories of Sherwood Anderson and Stephen Crane. Most recently, Open Letters Monthly published Appearing as Poe's Father, a speculation on Poe's probable biological father, which was in August of 2012. Chapter 7 in the Cambridge History of American Poetry and two books reappraising the achievement of William Cullen Bryant, An American Voice, and The Complete Stories of William Cullen Bryant. At present, Mr. Gott, Professor Gatto, oh, Professor Gatto, he died, <laughs> resides in White River Junction, and he plans to begin writing his memoirs this very year. Thank you so much for being here, and enjoy our lecture. Over to you, Professor okay. Gatto. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not being paid to be called professor anymore. Uh, <laughs> hey, you will do fine. Okay. In planning for this uh, double lecture on Stephen Crane, I thought I would start in talking about realism. It's a term that um, seems so simple to understand and yet is so often misunderstood. But then I was convinced that no, the audience might first prefer to hear something about Stephen Crane's biography and its relationship to his writing, and we covered that last week. So now, I hope it won't be too dreary to sit through, I'd like to talk a bit about realism and what it means. And I'd like to distinguish realism with a lowercase r from realism with an uppercase r. One can say that the tendency towards greater and greater realism really begins sometime at the close of the Middle Ages uh, the beginning of the Renaissance, one might one wanted to find a particular figure to say that this is the headwaters of realism with a lowercase r. Um, Boccaccio is as good a figure as any. And realism tends to be associated, at least in its early stages, with humor. That's both on the stage and on the written page. Uh, what does realism mean in this context? Well, principally that the writer, the text that's being uh, delivered to the reader, uh, is enhanced by attention to those details that make it easier for the reader to understand or to perceive what is being written about as part of his or her world. And so we tend to have greater description and more particular description, more metaphor and so forth. And as I just said, that need to bring the text, to bring the story, to bring the poem, whatever, closer to the consciousness uh, of the reader is more uh, intensely in evidence in comedy than it is in prose, or certainly in poetry, where it, it was seen as the duty of the poet, to use that word in its broader signification, uh, was trying to deal with noble subjects. And I guess the feeling was that the nobler we are, the further we are from the human condition. But if we talk about man in his more ridiculous mode, that is, that which is humorous, then uh, we, we want to bring that closer to our experience, to the world that we live in. That tendency towards realism intensifies uh, as we move ahead in literary history. It certainly becomes more important in the 18th century. Ian Watt, who wrote a groundbreaking book on the novel, uh, claims that it starts in the 18th century. That is certainly a pivotal moment in American, American in, um, in Western cultural history, 
Why? Because we see at that point the emergence of a middle class, of a new audience, of an audience uh, of readers who are not privileged people, at least not in the normal thinking of the word privileged. They're not aristocrats. They're not uh, members of a court. That the writer has to depend upon someone buying a, a book uh, or uh, going to a play. Um, uh, that the writer is on a, in a more immediate relationship to that middle class audience. And that middle class audience, understandably enough, wishes to find itself reflected and can more easily identify with that fiction of whatever sort um, through the devices of realism, being convinced that the people he is seeing or reading about are very much like himself uh, or like the people that he knows in his uh, social uh, surroundings. And indeed, if you look at the history of the novel, certainly in Great Britain, in, in English, what you tend to see is uh, a, a, a fictionalized version of biography, of a life, of how this person came to be who he or she is, in the case of Maul Flanders, one of the, one of the, uh, in the Defoe's novel, uh, you know, one of the marvelous works of the uh, 18th century. Uh, it, but it also allowed that audience to understand how people he or she would not normally come into contact tact with, also live with the story of Mal Flanders, for example, we see a woman's progression into prostitution uh, and uh, uh, how she deals with um, rising in society through catering to man's, should we say, baser, more realistic um, instincts. So the novel itself is a creation of the middle class and it is a creation, or at least it fosters, it fosters um, a climate for realism, lowercase r. Now, and we get to the 19th century, 100 years later, 100 years past the beginnings of the novel, we see that, that our sense of how we perceive reality has changed. Uh, for one thing, we begin to see the birth of, we, the beginnings of photography, uh, where one can render more directly the, the uh, 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 goings and comings of human beings. We see the rise of what looks like modern day journalism, keeping people abreast of what is happening beyond the borders uh, of the town. And so what happens is that there's a movement that uh, is, um, uh, arises, and it, rise, it arises in several places at the same time. So it's not as though it all owes to one groundbreaking author. And that is capital R realism, where it, the realistic detail is not simply um, an instrument for um, immediate recognition of what, it is, what is being described, but the very purpose of that work of art is to hold a mirror up to reality, to, to use Stendhal's uh, definition of a novel, that a, a, a novel is a mirror carried along the road of life. Um, that one should judge it in terms of the, its success in portraying the conditions of life and causing the reader to deliberate, uh, to recognize, to wonder about what makes life the way it is. What are the values, what are the moral values that sustain a society, that sustain an individual, that an individual carves for himself or herself in the course of this lifetime. Now, the American novel, as I've mentioned at some point in the past here, in dealing, I think it was in dealing with Melville, the American novel is really basically different from the English novel in that it tends to derive in its conception from the short story. American writers, unlike British writers, get their training in the short story. Their conception as to what is the proper feel for this fiction is trained by their experience, by their formulation of short stories. So we tend not to have, for the most part, American novels that are simply fictionalized biographies, or pretend to be, uh, but that the novel becomes an unfolding of a theme. 
And there's a close relationship between that and the way in which one conceives of the short story as more than simply an anecdote, more than something that is uh, uh, united by, um, by a plot, by the dynamics of, of a plot. Uh, and that, that sense of, of an integration of all of its elements is much more highly prized in the short story and also in the American novel. Um, well, S Stephen Crane is one of the prime movers in that movement, although he doesn't see himself initially as enlisting in a movement. It is simply a product of a way of seeing that has been um, affected, that has been trained, that has been shaped by his experience. His first job was as a journalist, and it wasn't in writing hard news, but in writing what we would call today color pieces. And he didn't think of himself as writing short stories at quite that point. But when, and there was a ready market for the short story, because this period after the Civil War shows this enormous uh, uh, expansion, not only of the American economy, and not only of a middle class, but also of a national literature, conscious of itself as national, and reaching this great audience through the means of the magazine. So one could make a living actually writing for magazines, which was not really true before, although one could begin to think in those terms, begin to think in those terms in the 1820s and 1830s, and it starts to flower at the point at which Poe comes on uh, stream and, and Hawthorne to a lesser degree. Uh, and, but there's a, an incredible explosion of this market for short fiction, for the short story. Indeed, the very term short story comes into being, not just as a description that it's a short story, but a conceptually a short story, one word if you can think of it that way, or a hyphenated word as was frequently used at that time. And Stephen Crane decides he is going to be a writer really fairly early on. Um, at first, I think, as I think I mentioned last time, he tried to emulate Mark Twain and even Poe. One cannot think of two more dissimilar American models for writing, but both uh, have a, a guiding sense of what makes a story. For Twain, it's the joke. He's a humor writer. There's a punchline uh, which depends upon the working out of the joke. In the case of Poe, it's the horror. He, he writes for that last paragraph in which there's suddenly an explosion of terror or, uh, or of fear that, uh, that uh, you know, pounces on us. Um, and, and that combination of reporting the world as he finds it, journalistic background, and of a plotted thing, of an integral thing, is very much on his mind. And it's, it is a journey that Crane himself has to make in the course of his conception of the short story. I would say that, um, no, it's interesting that if you look at American literature and you think of our major writers, that there is a much greater portion of them that owe their reputations to the short story than to the novel. I think of Hemingway, for example, uh, and, and his, the, you know, the history of his reputation. And I think we'd have to concede that he's not a very good novelist, despite the continuing uh, reputation of uh, Sun Also Rises, which was his first book, and of A Farewell to Arms. In fact, before he wrote Sun Also Rises, he said the novel is dead, and the future belongs entirely to the short story. And then when the uh, publishers came to him with a contract, he changed his mind and produced The Sun Also Rises. Uh, nevertheless, I think that his genius is to be found in the early short stories uh, rather than in the novel, but that's the subject for uh, another talk some other time. Anyway, so here we have, we have Crane really trying to train himself as a writer. As I mentioned last time, uh, perhaps the most fecund relationship he has in his early years is with Hamlin Garland, who himself is very much conscious of realism develops his own brand of realism, which he calls veritism, uh, and, and uh, includes in this, his own definition not just a report of how things are, but also of how one feels, that the reader should feel the way 
and in the, the very manner that the story, while the story is developing, feel the way that these characters feel. Garland, as I said last time, is pretty much a forgotten author, author today, but he was quite an important figure for his own time. Uh, in the realistic movement, he is uh, outpaced or uh, outshone only by William Dean Howells in the 1890s, or one could go even a little bit further back and say in the 1880s. Uh, Mark Twain, uh, seen as a realistic writer, is uh, a significant figure, but you know, his realm is humor, uh, even though some of his darkest visions come to the fore in the uh, early years of the, uh, of the 20th century. It's kind of humor that turns upon itself, that eats its own intestines, if you like. Well, it's not a very th good thing to like, but anyway, um, uh, th that inversion is always a dark side to, uh, to Mark Twain. So, Crane meets uh, Garland. Garland becomes his sponsor. Uh, uh, an enthusiast who's trying to open doors for him to the extent to which he can. Crane follows up on that, uh, on that uh, uh, path that has been, he has been directed to by, uh, by Garland and to a lesser extent by William Dean Howells, who's not only a, an important writer for the period, but also as the editor of the most prestigious magazine, Atlantic Monthly, uh, is uh, also a very powerful influence on taste uh, in America. And as I mentioned last time, Crane has a very hard time getting started. Uh, the novel, the story, if you like, the narrative that he thought would make his reputation, Maggie, a girl of the streets, a steady account of a descent of a young woman from innocence and um, respectability into prostitution and the implication is of a, a sad death, is the straight line of, uh, of that novel. But that novel did not immediately uh, gain, any, uh, uh, gain any adherence at all. It, it, developed, it developed fans, it developed supporters along the way, but not initially. It was because of its subject matter. It was still by this middle class audience seen as not a very pleasant subject for uh, uh, a vicarious experience through reading. Uh, there was something very salacious, not only sad, not only uh, frightening about this girl's descent. It has been called the first naturalistic novel in America, and this brings up the second term, I think, that needs some definition, some explanation. When I was in college, among the many erroneous things I was taught or told, was that naturalism is simply realism uh, taken to the ash can, uh, taken into the alley, instead of it being along the main roads of life, that it's, uh, it's, the, it's the hidden part, the alleys, the, the by streets, the, the parts that are not well lit. That really isn't true. If we look at naturalism in terms of its product, what we see is that particular choice of subject matter. But naturalism is also a philosophy, and that philosophy doesn't restrict the writer to any, uh, to any particular stratum of society. What is naturalism? It sees man not as um, a special animal between the, uh, the brutes and God, but as very much part of the same universe as all things, that man's actions are determined not by free will, but by uh, his genes or his blood, as it was said in those days, uh, by what is natural to him, what is already there at the time of his birth, in interaction with an environment that our values are shaped not by uh, some decree from, from above, but by experience. And, and this was also the period in which Darwin starts to have a greater and greater influence on American society and American thinking. And one of these days it may even reach some areas of our country where 
uh, it is held to be the, the work of the devil and uh, a path of, uh, of atheism. But the rest of the civilized world certainly has accepted Darwinism, and Darwin says man has evolved in the same way that every other animal has evolved. So we, therefore, if we are going to study man, and the, it is the proper study of man that is the subject of literature, we have to recognize those qualities. What is it that drives us? The need for survival, um, our sexual nature, uh, our need for uh, for uh, hierarchy, for a sense of accomplishment. And we look at man in those brute means. It took a long while for naturalism to gain adherence. And in fact, one can say that it, it has never really won the day in America, as it did in Europe. We can trace naturalism as a, a code to the writings of Emile Zola, who in, I believe it was in 1880, published an essay called The Experimental Novel. And what he said was that in this age of science, that science, not the church, but science is the means to knowledge, that we have to adapt and adopt scientific means to our literary endeavors. It's okay, and he takes Claude Bernard, a, um, a uh, biologist, a biochemist, uh, as his example. He said, what does Bernard do in, uh, in uh, understanding the world? He devises an experiment, which is a, uh, a piece of nature that he brings into his laboratory. And he subjects those natural materials to various tests, to various conditions, changes in temperature, humidity, you know, whatever. And then records the results. Uh, and simply stems, stems back, he has no stake in the matter, um, whether oxygen is given off at the end of the experiment or not, is not a matter of, uh, uh, of real concern to him. What is important is recording the truth of what happens in the course of that experiment. Well, in the study of human beings, it's very hard, although it's done in our universities all the time, uh, of creating a laboratory condition for human beings. In fact, now if you want to do it, you've got to go through all kinds of red tape in order to do that. It, man's behavior is, occurs outside the walls of the university or the studio. It's going on all around us. So what is the role of the novelist? What is the role of the fiction writer? He observes what goes on. He has experienced reality. He has experienced society. And what he then does is to bring that experience into his study, which then serves as his laboratory. And he brings these characters and these situations, which he has copied from the world outside, and brings them into interaction. And then, presumably, uh, like the uh, laboratory uh, uh, conductor, um, he records what the results of this experiment are, again, without any vested interest in one side or the other. And what we see in the, in the um, 19th century, more in Europe than in the United States, but certainly in, across Western civilization, is the, the use of this idea, of this technique, uh, and uh, th this definition of the role of the, um, of the writer. Um, so what we see in, in Maggie and what we see in some of uh, Crane's short stories, such as the experiment, note the use of the word, in misery and experiment in luxury, is precisely this kind of, of experiment, one might say, uh, of, of uh, observing, bringing into one's notebook or whatever it is one writes into these various elements, elements and seeing what the consequences are. Um, uh, Maggie was not a great success. Uh, nobody stood up immediately and no, I shouldn't say nobody. There were people who did hail it as a, a new stage in literary history. But uh, the public at large, the people who bought books did not. So Crane is thrown back now on how was he going to make a living 
and he has to make a living as a writer, how is he going to find uh, the means to survive? Again, in almost Darwinistic terms. And for Red Badge of Courage, as I mentioned last time, he saw the popularity of Civil War accounts. And he decided, okay, if this is what the public wants, I will supply it to them. Even though Crane, by this time, has seen himself as a realist and has stressed in his writing and his conversations with others the importance of reporting, the uniqueness of experience, not in the old worn out cliches, but to bring that sense of immediacy in the writing to the nature of experience. Even though he stresses that, he chooses as a subject the Civil War, which you know, ended years before he was born. But he brings his experience of life he brings his experiences that he said from, from uh, prep school, uh, from his struggle for survival, for, uh, for a sense of dignity and self-respect into that book. And that book is an enormous success. And one can divide Crane's career into pre-Red Badge of Courage and post. It's not only a great success in the United States, it's an enormous success in Great Britain and in Europe. Um, Joseph Conrad is certainly one of the major writers internationally of the 19th century and early 20th century. And he spoke of Crane as being his teacher, that Crane taught him how to write The Heart of Darkness. Um, the preface to The Nigger of the Narcissus, one of his major novels, um, contains Conrad's theory of, of writing, good writing. He says, the, the duty of the novelist is to make you, and then he puts this in terms of the senses, to make you hear, to make you smell, to make you touch, but above all to make you see. And that's often quoted. Well, he gets that as a result of his friendship when Crane moves to England and their intimate discussions. I'm not saying that, that Conrad didn't have this in mind, but it's Crane who brings this all to a focus that concentrates Conrad's own attention to this. Even Henry James, who seems so different a writer, uh, credits Crane with affecting his approach to writing, even though uh, James's career and James's style long precedes um, uh, uh, Crane's. All right. We also hear another word uh, associated with Crane and with the late uh, 19th century uh, itself, and that word is impressionist. The term is borrowed from painting and from Monet and, and the various writers of his circle we refer to as impressionist. This is still in the realm of reproducing reality, but it's that instant of, of reality that is the object of the impressionist painter. The, the effect of light uh, that, in a sense, changes what we expect of reality and captures instead that moment. That, that, and, and, and that capture is what uh, arrests our attention in looking at that painting. Well, Crane tries to do the same sort of thing, and he is also aware of what the Impressionist painters are doing. And he had, uh, he had reproductions of Monet up in his office at a about this, uh, about this time. It's not something he starts off with, uh, start, that he starts his career with, but it's something that he adopts, uh, a term he adopts, an analogy he adopts uh, as his career is underway. An impression, well, what does this mean then? Uh, in fact, Conrad, uh, at least initially, well, citing his importance, <laughs> says that Crane is our own, uh, Crane is our only impressionist writer. But, and here he takes away what he's just can't given him, but he is only an impressionist. And that's, I think, a very sage comment. I started off uh, last week saying that I believe that Crane, for all of his importance, is really a minor writer. And I think this nails it. Uh, even though um, Conrad later, uh, later, it wasn't that many years, but, but subsequently, saw that there was more to Crane's writing than immediately struck the eye or immediately struck one's consciousness. 
uh, that there was a philosophy, that there was a way of looking at life that underlay that impressionistic moment that he captured so well. In fact, probably better than anybody else writing at this particular time. Okay, so Crane sees himself as an impressionist. And we have to step back and think of Crane entering into um, the theater of, of literature now and saying to himself, what are my stories going to be like? He wants to free himself, at least initially, from the tyranny of plot. How else can we integrate uh, writing? How else can we give organization to what I impressionistically, uh, realistically uh, uh, want to deliver to uh, the reader? Um, and he, 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 he is, one can think of him as being a pre-Hemingway Hemingway in terms of how he wants to organize that material. Um, where we see the interplay of elements and then we have to take our consciousness beneath the surface of that story to understand how these things are related. Uh, for this book, Drawn from Life, collection of, of stories, I didn't just pick what I thought were the best stories. In fact, I deliberately stayed away from that standard. I wanted to show Crane's evolution as a writer, and so I selected these pieces for showing that arc of development. And one of the stories that is never anthologized, I mean, one of the problems with reading criticism of Crane is that they, they focus on just a few stories. Uh, in fact, um, someone, uh, I, I took this off of the, uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, well, it, it was a, a typical description of Crane. Uh, and uh, in this case, it was a statement made by Harold Bloom, who was the poobah of American criticism, at least uh, during the past few decades. And he s says we admire Crane for the open boat, for the Blue Hotel, for The Bride Comes to Yellow Sky, and for A Mystery of Heroism. It is very rare to find any critic mentioning another story, but if we're interested in seeing the development of a certain artistic consciousness, we should look before and after those stories. And maybe we'll have a chance to look a little more closely at those. And the story I selected uh, for one of the stories I selected was called Bink's Day in the Country, and, but then when he made his list of stories, he wrote Bink's, the, the last name was supposed to be B-I-N-K-S, and he put an apostrophe in it, and so somewhere else he calls it something else, so I gave it a new name uh, to avoid that uh, sick in the, uh, uh, after the title. I called it A Day in the Country, which is pretty true to, to the titles that he did use. And what we have here is a portrait of a man who has been um, reduced to anonymity. He's a clerk in New York. And he hates his job, but he's a functionary. And we see him as first as part of that social machine. And there's no vitality in him. He feels oppressed. Crane mentions a little patch of grass in the city and how that little patch of grass, that green, emphasis on the color, affects him emotionally. He looks forward to an escape, an escape for only one day. And he tells his family that he's going, to, we are going out into the country. Now, he goes to the country for peace, for, for serenity, for uh, a natural state to discover just the, and enjoy what makes a human a human being. We go out into the country, we get a description of that, and instead of that piece, what we're treated to is the hurly-burly, the, 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 that nature itself is in a great deal of movement. And what had been so desirable for Binks, that serenity, and that sense of being part of nature is exactly what he doesn't feel. What happens now is a sense of, of, uh, um, of panic almost. He doesn't know how he's to relate to all of this. He doesn't know how to relate to the family, to the aunt who greets him. 
he feels very much alone and outside. So that ironically, and irony is uh, Crane's stock and trade, that ironically, that he feels more alienated than he had in the very city. And the things that, de that, that um, uh, depleted his sense of his humanity. And that's how the story closes. Now, that ironic vision is a basic pattern in almost everything that Crane writes. He's a he, is, he is chiefly an ironist. Um, I talked about Crane's interest in Hemingway. In 1891, among his very first stories ever published, 1891, also the year of Melville's death, and one can see that change now in sensibilities, uh, uh, even though they lived uh, you know, with, within a few minutes of each other when Crane lived in New York City uh, and Melville was in New York City. The, there's no record of their ever having met or of Crane's ever having even read Melville. Uh, but it's interesting that, that you know, the beginning of one career and the end of another man's life, one of the giants of American literature. This story is called Killing His Bear. All right? And what we have is a little man, he's never given a name, and that designation of the protagonist as the, a little man is frequent in these early stories because he wants to show the relative insignificance of the individual in this complex world. Uh, and the struggle for really for a sense of who he is, who this, who this, uh, this non-entity could be in this world that really overwhelms him, in this system that is so intricate and uh, reduces him to, to insignificance. And um, well, I thought I'd just begin it, uh, give you a, a, a paragraph of it, and you can see some of his, that, that early technique at first flower. In a field of snow, some green pines huddled together and sang in quavers as the wind whirled among the gullies and ridges. Icicles dangled from the trees' beards, and the dust, <coughs> dust of snow lay upon their brows. Note this, it's very painterly in its approach. And indeed, Crane, about this time, was living with a bunch of artists and saw that his roommate was an illustrator and an artist, a man named Linson. Um, on the ridge top, a dismal choir of hemlocks crooned over one that had fallen. The dying sun created a dim purple and flame-colored tumult on the horizon's edge, and then sank until the level crimson beams struck the trees. As the red rays retreated, armies of shadows. Now, note that in this natural description, we have a sense of underlying conflict, that nature is not, not placid but is a scene of, of constant struggle among its uh, various elements. And, and Crane likes the use of military terminology. So we speak here of these armies. Um, a gray ponderous stillness came heavily in the steps of the sun. A little man stood under the quavering pines. He was muffled to the nose for, in fur and wool, and, in, and a hideous cap was pulled tightly over his ears. His cold and impatient feet had stamped a small portion of hard snow beneath him. A black-barreled rifle lay in the hollow of his arm. All right, this is now this. We have the little man, and we have the rifle, which is the means by which he's going to try to assert an identity and a power over life. His eyes watery from incessant glaring, as, a, uh, as some job he's had, swept over the snow fields in front of him. His body felt numb and bloodless, and soft curses came forth and froze on the icy wind. He's going to go forth and kill a bear. The bear is much larger than he is. Uh, the bear is a brute, has no consciousness of this little man. Uh, and certainly in terms of power, there's much greater power uh, in the presence of the bear than there is in this little man. But the little man now, in order to assert himself and to gain uh, some notion of nobility, of, of control over nature, is going to shoot this bear, this large bear. Um, now I'll, I'll, I'll jump to the end. When the rifle cracked, it should, shook his soul to a profound depth. 
Creation rocked and the bear stumbled. The little man sprang forward with a roar. He scrambled hastily in the bear's track. The splash of red, now dim, drew a faint, timid beam on the kindred's shade in the snow. The little man bounded in the air. I mean, here is this noble beast, this great beast, has now been, been humbled by this one little shot from this little man. Hit, he yelled, and ran on. Some hundreds of yards forward, he came to a dead bear with his nose in the snow. Blood was oozing slowly from a wound under the shoulder, and the snow about was sprinkled with blood. A mad froth lay in the animal's open mouth, and his limbs were twisted from agony. The little man yelled again and sprang forward, waving his hat. You know, how ludicrous he is to think that uh, he's now won a victory, and yet that's what the little man feels. As if he were leading the cheering of thousands. That's the way he sees himself, as a hero, a protagonist. He ran up, and now here, to the extent that you have been on the side of this little man and been um, sharing his consciousness, he ran up and kicked the ribs of the bear. What a pusillanimous you know, thing to do. Upon his face was the smile of the successful lover. You know, what we have here is a foreshadowing of Hemingway uh, in terms of his you know, emphasis upon hunting and all the rest, except that Crane sees the, the silliness and the futility and the, and the pitiability of, uh, of man. But there's something else that's going on here too, and that is while he is, he is wrestling with the bear and about to shoot him, what Crane, Crane's description of it is, is nothing but sexual that there's a sexual sense of, of ecstasy, there's a sexual sense of, of, of fear, of, of losing of oneself in that embrace. Very early, very, very um, uh, perceptive of him, uh, of, uh, of Crane, and it, I think the story really deserves more attention, and certainly in its connection to, to Hemingway. One of the things I said last time was that, that, um, that Crane's mother lived with uh, with Hemingway in New York, not lived with in the sense of cohabiting, but uh, they saw each other uh, f quite frequently uh, through the, um, the uh, well, their artistic uh, um, uh, um, milieu. She was studying to be an opera singer. And in fact, she becomes the heroine of, or well, not the heroine, but she is a, a protagonist, a principal figure in his novel, The Third Violet, not one of his more successful works. Um, let's, uh, let, let's look at, at, well, two more stories I'd like anyway. One is a story that I think deserves a lot more attention, um, and is, it shows the craft of the man really very early, and it's called The Pace of Youth. And what we have here is a man who runs a merry-go-round, and it's been said by Crane's biographers, that Crane is borrowing here on one of his early love affairs uh, for a woman named um, Monroe, a woman who was uh, married, Crane was in love with, and uh, he wanted her to, to, uh, to marry him. And uh, the family was not at all happy about this, saw no future in Stephen Crane's choice of a career. And so told, they told their daughter, stay away from this man, and she saw the good sense of it, and she rejected him several times in his uh, quest for marriage. Now, what's interesting to me is that Crane doesn't just take this and put it into fictio fictional form. He transforms it. It is a story not from the point of view of the young man who's in love with the young girl, but a story of the fathers coming to terms with this. Initially, Stimson, who owns the merry-go-round, is contemptuous of the young man. What we see Crane doing now is harnessing symbolism, or maybe I should say certain natural elements in the story which take on a meaning in terms of the way in which the story is organized. This merry-go-round, which Stimson owns, becomes a symbol away in a way of life. The, unlike the, unlike horses in nature, and they will come into the story, or you know, real horses, 
Here, one rides these illusions, with these carved horses. The merry-go-round goes around and around. The purpose of the, of the going around is to reach for a ring. What will the brass ring that you get enable you to do? Have more trips around and around. So there's a sense of the futility of this. And this also becomes a way of describing Stimson, the owner's life. Here we have the young man and the young woman. Vitality is pulsing through their, uh, their arteries. You know, there's a sense of, of, uh, uh, of lust that takes over their being. He can think of nothing but her. She can think of nothing but him. They pretend that they're not, they're not looking at each other, but they really are, and so forth, this kind of thing. And then finally, they come to the point where they decide to elope. And so that circle of the merry-go-round on the horses now becomes a very real chase on horses on the part of Stimson, who has been so contemptuous of the young man. And now, during the course of this chase, loses speed, and he is outdistanced. And this becomes, of course, recognition that he is getting old, and he no longer has those qualities, those um, uh, traits that will enable him to win the race, to win the prize, in this case, the young man who's at, after his daughter. And so he accepts that and simply falls back. It is a remarkably well-crafted story, and one, as I said, that should uh, that deserves greater attention. The story that, the story that, that uh, made um, Crane a short story writer of note and that also really boosted his career after, um, you know, gave him a firm footing after Red Badge of Courage was The Open Boat, which was based entirely on his actual experience when he went down to Jacksonville and uh, uh, sailed on a, on a filibuster on one of those boats that was running munitions and the boat sank. And here we have now four men in a boat. And how do, you know, through the Crane, Crane's dispatch, when he writes this up, was printed all over the United States. But what is more remarkable is the story that he then crafts using exactly the same elements. So we can study the two and really see the artist at work. How do you transmute journalistic reporting and excellent journalistic reporting into the stuff of fiction? And how, too, at this early stage, does Crane reconceive the short story so it's not based on plot, but on relationship of different elements? What we see is these, these men in the boat struggling for survival, very Darwinistic in that way. And the question is, who is going to survive, or are they going to survive at all? And the refrain in the story is, who in the, you know, the, 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 what you know, kind of God uh, could put us in this kind of position, the, the gods who rule the sea? You know, how, how do we, how, we are but playthings in their hands. And there's no reason, there's no intellectual solving of puzzles. Billy, the oiler, is the most able of the men. He's the strongest. He, uh, he's, he constantly is at the oars. And we know from the start that if anyone deserves in this Darwinistic world to survive, it's Billy. They're trying to get the ocean. The sea is the enemy, as it were. It represents danger. And all along, the land represents safety. When they get close to the land, they see somebody waving. But they also now suddenly have this recognition that if, as they grow closer, that they become hostage to the waves that can overturn the boat, crash it, and cause them to drown. And so that which had been the goal now becomes the enemy. Again, that's guiding irony, that reversal that becomes a basic pattern in his works. You know, how does Henry Fleming and Red Badge of Courage uh, conduct himself? He wants to be a hero. He's a phony hero. His, he has a phony red badge that, is, that attests his courage. And then feeling, uh, 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 feeling like a fraud, then he performs in a way that is truly heroic. And it's that play of those elements that makes that novel, that gives structure to that novel. So in this story, that which had been safety becomes danger. And indeed, I, the cap the irony, it is Billy the oiler, who, as in life, as actually happened, the fittest of them, the one who most deserved, in, by any measure, to survive, who 
uh, who dies. One more story, and I'd like to maybe close with this, because it's also a sign that even though the short story, the American short story, is one of our real gems, it's our, perhaps our major contribution to world literature, um, and it certainly deserves closer critical appreciation and study, and how it, it's sort of a stepchild, and we have never given it sufficient attention. Um, the Blue Hotel was written by Crane after his trip to the West. He had gone to the West while waiting for the fate of Red Badge of Courage to be settled. And so rather than sit around in New York, he takes off and goes to the West. And he'd always been a great admirer of the West. He'd read dime novels. And he was full of that, you know, that sense of the West that most American kids grow up with, cowboys and Indians, you know, the rudiments of life in conflict and all that. And in fact, one of his prized possessions was a gun that he was told was really owned by what, Billy the Kid or some such figure. And he takes that with him out West. Well, the subject of the stories is actually his disappointment in what he finds out west. You know, going out there, and ex the frontier is closed. When? 1890, right? First census that, that, that defines that the frontier is closed, defines the, the end of the frontier. And, um, and Crane writes about his own disappointment in that. Even though one part of him wants to see this myth of the west as false and to something to be debunked. At the same time, he regrets the loss of that myth, uh, that uh, somehow our experience of America is less for that myth no longer, if it ever existed, uh, being, uh, being on the ground. The Blue Hotel story he writes very hurriedly, as he writes so much towards the second part of his career, frantic to, to support the the uh, ever higher costs of living with Cora Crane, who seems to spend with gay abandon, uh, trying to uh, justify uh, the role of aristocrat that she uh, wraps around herself. And so he, um, um, he writes a story quite quickly, and it is rejected. And people look upon this and say, look at how foolish these editors were. Here is perhaps his greatest short story, and it's rejected. But I think one can understand why it's rejected, because finally it shows, it shows to me Crane's falling short of greatness as a writer, that he had become so dependent upon his writing as a way of making a career that he didn't give sufficient thought to what he is doing. If, read that story again and see whether, you know, what it is that holds it together. It is, it is a combination of ironies. Here is the Swede, who may not be a Swede, who's probably German or whatever it is, who goes out expecting, because he has read all the dime novels, to find a certain kind of West which no longer exists. And the symbol of that is the Blue Hotel. Why is it blue? Because, because the uh, Scully, who owns the hotel, wants it to be a commercial attraction. It wants people coming by on the Pullmans. It, the Pullmans, again, being a sign of the domestication of the West. The Pullman is a rolling bedroom, after all. Um, to stop, he wants them to stop at his hotel. And what goes on here is an interplay between the Swedes' expectations and the reality. And here's Scully saying, no, 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 this is, you know, you have nothing to be afraid of. This is a very tame place. And here's my, here was my little daughter, and she's dead, and what a sweet girl she was, and everything is tame. But of course, the Swede will not be convinced, and he becomes such an annoyance in his conviction that he's under threat here, and that these men are going to kill him, that finally what happens is that it's an eruption of violence um, Scully says, okay, fight the young boy, his son. We assume that the young man is going to win, but actually the Swede wins. The other men have been so worked up about all this that they want to hit the Swede anyway, which violates the rules. Um, Scully says, no, no, no. Again, in keeping with his role as someone who says, we've got to be civilized about this. These were the terms, one man, one man fighting, the Swede won fair and square. 
the Swede leaves and goes to another place. And there becomes just as annoying as he was in the first place, except that in the first part of the story, we're sort of on the Swede side. We sympathize with him. We want him to survive. But in the second part, he becomes such an annoyance, such a bully, uh, that we feel that he deserves whatever happens to him. And here we have the gambler, again a figure from the mythology of the West. But this gambler, although he breaks the rules, he cheats, just as, you know, Sweet accuses Scully's son of doing. Uh, he cheats, but he's, he's a cheat who understands the rules of society. He fits in. He only cheats those people who can afford to lose. He's a, a benign citizen in this community. And then the Swede pesters him so until finally what happens is that, that irrationally the gambler pulls a knife and kills him. But in striving for this irony, has, has Crane really developed one idea or the, what this story is about? Uh, he tries with this, this awful symbol, at least I think so, although a lot of critics like it. When the Swede falls, the sign on the cash register goes up and says, this registers uh, your purchase. Well, the question is, what has he purchased? What idea is is encapsulated in this symbol. And I've never been able to resolve it to make sense of that story. And I think that's true of a good deal of what he writes hurriedly at the end. Certainly his novels uh, that are written primarily to make money because, uh, uh, because those bills keep piling up fail. Finally, what we see in Crane is a failure of the artist. So even though the, the gospel that he represents, the, uh, you know, the tide in literary history that uh, he shows so brilliantly uh, will wash ahead into the 20th century and determine the shape of fiction for a long time to come, that he himself uh, recedes. And by 1920, same time that Melville is rediscovered, Crane is rescued from the obscurity into which he has fallen. And in the attempt to identify an American literature, which was a conscious enterprise after the First World War, uh, to introduce Ameri the study of American literature into American colleges and universities, uh, the recognition at long last that we did have a literature which was distinct and comparable to that of, of Great Britain, uh, that, that these two men are rediscovered and become part of this pantheon of our literary history. A fascinating writer and one which had, one who had the talent really to rise much higher, but terribly fell far short. Died in, two, uh, in the year 1900, how significant is that? And uh, at the age of only 28. Okay, thank you very much.